Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate at uh, California Institute of Technology, and during the summer, I work with Ivan. Uh, on a project called Robust Constraint GSC Algorithm for Microphone Array Processing. And um, before beginning with my talk, I'd like to thank Ivan for his help. He was always there to help me if I have problems, questions, and even though he was very busy. So thank you very much. And thank you for attending the talk. So this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to first describe the project objectives and the scope of the project and then uh, talk about the, show, show you the hardware that I used for taking the recordings, and then review some of the existing algorithms, pros and cons of those algorithms, and finally propose, yeah, propose our algorithm and show you some experimental results. And then I will conclude my talk with some future work and comments. If, uh, if you have any questions, then don't hesitate to let me know. You, you can ask whenever you have questions. I try to um, focus on the big picture and just the con concept, and I'm not going to go into the de technical details so, so that you don't uh, fall asleep. So the project outline. So building a robust microphone array processing algorithm, uh, which, can be, uh, which can have good sound capturing capability in very noisy environments. The main target of this uh, project is actually automotive environments, so inside a car. While driving, you may want to call a friend uh, without using a closed up microphone. So because in many times, uh, you know, if you didn't wear it on before dry, start, starting to drive, sometimes it may be quite cumbersome. So the main target is the automotive environment. And there are two, uh, two different objectives. The first one is to enhance the speech for better communication. And the second one is improve the speech recognition for voice commander. Even though we didn't consider this part yet, it's included in future plans. So what are the challenges? Most of the existing algorithms for speech enhancement or interference rejection and things like that, they focus on an environment which has a relatively high SNR. So the noise level is relatively low. And uh, usually, the assumption that the noise is stationary um, is just OK. But then, the, the environment that we are interested in is completely different. First of all, the noise level is, is significantly higher, so very low SNR. And at the same time, there is considerable amount of non-stationary noise that comes from engine or passing, passing cars or whirling wind. And there are many such non-stationary noise sources. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for this reason, most traditional algorithms do not yield very satisfactory results for denoising and things like that. So in this project, what did we do? We first evaluated several existing algorithms to see how they work in such an environment where the noise is mainly non-stationary and where the SNR is very low. And then we experimented with various modifications of the existing algorithms to see how we can improve them. And finally, based on these experiments, we propose a new microphone array processing algorithm, which we believe had, um, is very promising. And have, we also have some interesting results. So what kind of hardware did we use? Uh, this is the linear microphone array uh, that we used during the experiments. As you can see, it has only four elements, so four elements. And if you take a look at this distance, it's quite short. So the distance is not, uh, not very large, which means that this will limit the overall beamforming capability of the microphone array. So why did we choose this uh, uh, structure? It's because we, uh, what we have in our mind is we, we want to use this microphone array in, inside a car. We, we want to install it in, in a car environment. But then, what is the most probable place where we can install such a linear microphone array? It's, it might be the rear view mirror. So it cannot be too long, because most of the rear view mirrors are around 20 centimeters. 
So we didn't want to make the whole length longer, longer than that. So these are the pictures of the actual microphone array. This is inside my car. Um, we installed it in the middle. Um, in, well, in the actual scenario, the driver should talk to give comments or to communicate with his friends over the cell phone, but then for safety reasons, uh, I was driving and the co-driver was doing the uh, recordings and things like that. And this is the recording device. So we have an 8-channel USB board. Four, channel, four input channels come from the microphone array because it has four elements. And the fifth one, uh, as a reference, we are using a closed-top microphone and use it as a reference signal uh, during the experiments. And then we also wanted to capture the en engine noise. So there is a, we used the microphone, installed the microphone inside the engine room. So, but then um, we, what we didn't take into consideration is we, we should have made the sensitivity of the uh, microphone lower such that it doesn't get clipped. <laughs> so we got a very periodic signal that's always clipped. So we couldn't use it in this time. This is connected to a USB hub, and then it's connected to the tablet PC, uh, which records the multi-channel multi inputs. And these things are for the future. We want to connect the GPS, accelerometer, and Bluetooth for communicating over the cell phone. But then uh, this is only for future expansion. So let me show you the hardware that I used. So this is the microphone array that we used during the recordings. Looks quite cool, in my opinion. <laughs> and then, uh, this is the recording device that we used. Or we connect these, uh, this microphone array to these blocks, and then this, uh, this goes to the engine room, and this goes to the closed microphone, and things like that. So if we open it, it has a USB board and a USB hub for future um, expansions. So let me continue. So these are the pictures of the actual recording device that I just showed. Uh, now let me review some of the previous methods that are candidates of uh, in in that were candidates in this project. Uh, let me quickly uh, review beamforming. I'm pretty sure that most of you are well aware of beamforming, but then just just in case. So using a microphone array instead of a single microphone can give us a larger degree of free degrees of freedom, and it can result in better sound capturing quality. So for example, if we know the location of the sound source, which is here in this example, and if we know that the sound that we are interested in is coming from this direction, we can use this information to enhance the captured sound quality. So we can, well, what's the good thing about using a microphone array? It's the thing that we can do spatial filtering uh, spatial filtering. Oh. oh, okay. Did I change the mode? Okay. Now it works. So we can do spatial filtering in addition to the traditional temporal filtering techniques. So for example, we, if we know that there is a, a large jammer signal coming from a different direction than the sound source, we can try to enhance the sound that comes from the direction of arrival. And then we can uh, uh, suppress the signal that comes from this direction, which is the direction of the jammer signal. So we can do something like this if we use a microphone array instead of a single microphone. The time invariant beamformer, um, or a fixed beamformer, it can be very simply implemented as a, sum of, a weighted sum of multiple channel inputs. So for example, if uh, xi is the input signal at frequency f, frequency band f, uh, for channel i, then we just simply weight it by a, weighting, uh, by a coefficient and sum it up for all the channels. And now we get a beamformer output. So we can make the beamformer such that it focus, uh, focuses on uh, expected direction of arrival thereby rejecting interference that comes from different directions and just um, and enhance the overall quality of the captured signal. A simple example is the delay and sum beamformer, which adjusts the delays that, comes, that 
arises from the difference between the sound source and the uh, micro, each microphone. So it's a very simple kind, but then very widely used. It has some pros and cons. The following plot shows the uh, directivity, directivity pattern of a delay and some beamformer for the microphone array that we used. So four element microphone array, uh, where the sh distance between microphones are quite short. You can see that we have a peak here, which is one, which is the direction of arrival, zero degrees. So depending on the frequency, we have different patterns of the di for directivity. At very high frequencies, we can see several side lobes, which is undesirable. But then um, this is this is typical when we use a delay and some beamformer. Now let us uh, review GSE, which is, which stands for Generalized Side Lobe Canceller. It's very popular, and it's known to achieve relatively high interference can uh, cancellation. This is the basic structure of a generalized side lobe canceller. So we first have a beamformer. So the beamformer takes as an input. Um, in this case, we have four input channels. We, the beamformer accepts these four channels as the input and then outputs only one channel. So it tries to enhance the signal that comes from the expected direction of arrival. This is a typical shape of the uh, directivity pattern for, for a given frequency. So we can see that uh, at the direction of arrival, we have one, and then this value, the magnitude response, uh, gets smaller when it uh, when the actual direction of arrival is different from the oh, from the expected one. Now we have a blocking matrix, and what a blocking matrix is, does is it leaves everything but the signal that comes from the direction of arrival, and so what is what this tries to do is it wants to capture the interference signal and the noise and have only interference at these points. So it tries to cancel the target signal that we want to enhance. So finally, what we do is, oh, OK, I have to mention that usually a null, um, when we use a blocking matrix, the null has a, a, a much narrow, is much narrower compared to a beamformer. So when, when we use a beamformer, it is not exactly, um, not, uh, we cannot perfectly get rid of all the signal that comes from different directions. So by using this beamformer and this blocking matrix together, and then adding one more block, which extracts the remaining interference from the beamformer output, we can get a better signal. So the adaptive interference canceller, it receives interference that comes from the blocking matrix and then tries to remove it from the beamformer output. And then the final result, we hope that this is a cleaner version or cleaned up version that has only the signal that comes from a certain direction. So this is the idea of, of the generalized side lobe canceller. But then it has some problems. Although the GSC uh, shows good performance in rejecting, uh, rejecting directional interference, for example, if there is a gamma signal that comes from a given direction, then we can suppress it beautifully. But then the problem is, what we have large amount of ambient noise, or what if? Oh, another serious problem is, the GSC is very sensitive to the actual direction of arrival. So let's say we assume that the expected signal should come from 20 degrees, but then let's say it came from 25 degrees. Then what happens is. It will be passed through the beamformer because this is quite wide. But then the problem is, let's say the actual direction of arrival was 5 degrees away from the expected DOA. Then it has again something like this. So the target signal is not, uh, is not rejected in the blocking matrix, but it's pa passed to the adaptive interference canceller, which means that the target signal, there is a large amount of target signal that comes from out of this adaptive interference canceller, and it will be canceled at this point. So the quality of the final output will be very bad in this case. So this is a serious problem. The sensitivity to DOA or uh, steering vector errors is a serious problem, and there have been many attempts to fix this problem. So among many methods, one that's, that has been quite widely used is the one called Robust GSE proposed by Hoshiyama, Sugiyama, and Hirano. 
So uh, this robust GSC, which is implemented in the time domain, uh, is very robust to steering vector errors. So it can put up with direction of arrival, um, errors in direction of arrival, up to a specified value, which can be chosen by the user. And then it shows high interference rejection performance. So how different is the structure of a robust GSC compared to the traditional GSC? Here we have a beamformer, adaptive interference canceller. Everything is the same. The only difference is this part. So instead of having a blocking matrix, now we have an adaptive blocking matrix. So what does this guy try to do? It receives the output of the beamformer and uses this as the reference. It assumes that this guy is the target signal and then try to minimize the different, uh, maximize the different, no, no, minimize the difference between each input channel and this target signal, which means that even if the, the actual direction of arrival is a little bit different from the expected DOA, this adaptive blocking matrix will take care of it, such that only interference is, uh, is passed to the adaptive interference canceller. <coughs> That's the whole idea. So this is the de detailed block diagram of the uh, robust GSD. Instead of having a fixed blocking matrix, what it tries to do is this. So we have the beamformer output, and it goes through this uh, uh, adaptive, adaptive filter or adaptive blocking matrix, and then tries to cancel the portion that is correlated to the beamformer output, which should be close to the, the target signal, tries to, uh, the, uh, tries to remove the correlated portion to the beamformer output from each channel. So if this gives perfect target signal, then it means that this adaptive beam or blocking matrix should be capable of removing all the signal components and then pass only the interference or error signal to the adaptive interference canceller. So the ABM uses um, normalized, normalized LMS algorithm, but then there is one more constraint. So that's why they call it the coefficient constraint adaptive filter. So what are the constraints? As we can see, this is the error between the input, input signal and then the transformed uh, beamformer output tries to cancel and then this portion is the error. And we try to ma minimize this error such that we can get, uh, get rid of as much as possible um, from the input ch channel that is correlated to the uh, uh, target signal. Now, the, beamformer co uh, the adaptive filter coefficients are updated using the uh, uh, traditional way of normalized LMS. But then there is one more step that is used in this CCAF, or coefficient constraint adaptive filter, which is uh, there is a upper bound and a lower bound, if the coefficient or if the time domain coefficient of the adaptive filter exceeds some upper bound, then it's scaled down to this upper bound. If it gets below the, the lower bound, then it's uh, scaled up such that it meets the lower bound. So the coefficients are not allowed to exceed the boundaries that is predefined. And how are these uh, boundaries found? They are found based on the direction of the, the overall adaptive blocking matrix. So the adaptive blocking matrix is allowed to um, have the have direct or null only between plus, uh, let's say, if the direction of arrival is zero, then we can specify it such that uh, the null is formed only between minus 10 and 10. So if a signal comes from uh, 12 degrees, it means that it's not the target signal. So it, we can view it as the interference. So anyway, we have to first, in order to uh, specif uh, specify the uh, uh, adaptive blocking matrix, such that it have, forms a node towards a given direction, we first have to compute the bounds and then impose it as the constraints on the adaptive filter coefficients. Are this coefficient reversed? Oh, which one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this should be n plus 1. Sorry. And then um, also uh, this adaptive interference canceller does something similar to the generalized side lobe canceller. This is the beamformer output, and then this linearly combines the errors. So this, the interference is filtered through this adaptive interference canceller. So this part should contain only interference and noise. 
And this part is canceled, removed from the beamformer output. And y, uh, y sub O, this one is the final output. And in many cases, uh, we get only the clean signal without the interference. So this is a typical directivity pattern for a robust GAC proposed by Sugiyama and Hoshiyama. And in this case, we constrain the blocking, uh, blocking matrix to have a null between minus two, 20 and 20. So as a result, we have a good looking uh, adaptive beamformer that has, a, that has a flat region, magnitude response between minus 20 degrees and 20 degrees, and then very low uh, magnitude response in outside this region. So if, let's say this is the direction of arrival that we expected, but then the actual direction of arrival was a little bit off from zero degrees, let's say it was 10. Then still, it, it will be, it will have made the magnitude response of the beamformer is just still one, which means that it won't be canceled. So in this way, we can have a better working beamformer. And as we can see, it works very well for different kinds of frequency bands. Any questions so far? Uh, I don't know because uh, I, I think uh, we can already see that the, the side loops are getting higher. Maybe that's the reason that they, they show they don't show the directivity pattern for higher frequency bands. But then this was the plot that was included in the paper. I'm sorry. So this is from their paper. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which dimension? The dimension of this array. Oh, dimension. Uh, they they used a four four element uh, four element microphone array, yes. which is linear. How does it compare to your dimension? Uh, it's it, it. I think it was larger, but then I have to check it again. So it's four microphones. Yeah, that's right. Okay, but then there are some limitations. The first of all. Although the robust GSC proposed by Sugiyama and um, Hoshiyama, it, how does it try to um, uh, restrict the null of the adaptive blocking matrix within a specific region, which was minus 20, uh, be, between minus 20 degrees and 20 degrees in the previous example? It's by um, uh, imposing uh, constraints on the coefficients themselves. So for example, let's say at some point the adaptive filter coefficients, this is in the time domain, this is a tab index. Let's say this time domain filter, exceed, and one point in this time domain filter exceeded the, uh, the boundary. Then what does it do? It just kills down such that it's inside this boundary. But then <coughs> think about this. What happens if we just simply scale down the whole adaptive filter to make it fit inside this boundary. It's in this boundary, but then as this one, this one had a wrong direction, which is outside the region, this will also have a wrong direction, which is outside the region, right? So it's a, it's a very nice engineering solution, but then it doesn't guarantee that the null former is actually directing only between minus 20 degrees and 20 degrees. But then it works in many cases. But conceptually, there is a problem. And another thing is, if there is a significant amount of isotropic ambient noise, there's nothing we can do. Because we have lots of noise that also comes from the same direction where the target signal comes from. And when we want to use this microphone array uh, processing algorithm inside a car, um, actually we have a very large amount of ambient noise, which means that even if we have a very sharp pole, towards the actual direction of arrival, we'll still have a large amount of uh, noise. So for this, uh, for this reason, the robust GSC proposed by these people, it's, it's very nice for, uh, uh, it, it, it is very robust to, uh, robust to DOA or direction of arrival errors, but then maybe not very suitable for canceling ambient noise. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what is the ambient like in this? Uh, 
this one they, they took in a noiseless room which has low reverberation. So this is the classic scenario in general for all generalized cycle of gas masks. You have a sound source, you have interferon. Right. And you try to reject it. And right. usually they say, we did the experiments in low reverberation, P60, 10 milliseconds. Right. Wow. Where, where is the interference in this case? Oh, in this case, what they are doing is, there's no interference at all. But then, uh, to get this kind of a plot, initially they put the sound source in zero degrees, right. and then uh, compute this magnitude response, and then change the degrees from zero to increase it. So after 20, it should be rejected as well, because it, it's uh, beyond the specified region. Right, so your argument is, is, is weak for ambient, but this is ambient condition, right? So this is not a particular jammer from a, some di direction that is trying to tune out. Mm -hmm. And so your argument is this is not good for general, you know, ambient noise. But this is this is ambient, right? So oh, so what I mean is okay. Like so we get side, this kind right, of a side, uh -huh. so because of your explanation that this is good for jammers, but they didn't give the example for jammers. Oh, there are also examples for jammers. For example. Right. Uh, in those examples, we can see it. <laughs> oh, yeah. we only see your picture. So I'm, I'm just uh -huh. thinking about your argument about you know this is for jammers, but they give you a, a general uh -huh. kind of a, a ambient. Okay, so what I mean is this: let's say the target signal that we are interested in comes from uh, zero degrees. Okay, then the magnitude response for that signal will be just one. Let's say there is an interference which comes from 60 degrees. It'll be multiplied by this very low value, which is minus. Uh, so that's that's also my question. Um, this looks like it's adapted to the signals. Uh -huh. So if the signal comes from that direction, I suspect this will have a. That's right. It'll be just canceled. If it it, it will outside not this have the gain as plotted here. Uh -huh. The gain will be different. Yes. Is I right? It, am right. I right? If it's outside this region, that's right. Right. It'll so so again, <laughs> this figure doesn't show. Um, so I, I don't know if you understand what I mean. So so you this call this you can call this jammer suppression as a function of the incident diagonal. If you have a jammer, right, twenty right. degrees, thirty degrees, this is the suppression. But if you have a infinite number of channels, ambient noise, you'll see different picture. Are you asking whether this is linear and if you have two of them at the same no, time? No, I'm just yeah. saying uh, okay, he's saying if I have a sixty degree jammer, okay, you're gonna get that gain. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wonder, is, is, is that true? Because this figure, is that uh, is this game, particular game, um, how, how did you obtain this, obtain this game picture? You didn't have any jammer, right, when you did no. the game. So that's what I'm saying. When you have a jammer, and the adaptive algorithm will try to cancel that jammer. So you, I suspect you actually get a, a, a smaller gain, or even more attenuation at that jammer. ATI system, that would not happen, but it's time varying because of the adaptation. Right, right. So, so, so this is not representative of what gain you will you will get if you do have a jammer from oh, yeah, that's right. side directions. Uh -huh. So in that case, for example, if we have a jammer here right. and the target signal here, uh -huh. it may have a coefficient which looks like Something like this, for example. Yeah, and then a uh -huh. bigger deep, a maybe kind of a strange shape. Elsewhere. That's that's true. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But then, uh, you know, since this is adaptive and time variant, right. it's it's, it's not. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this figure just shows the concept that uh, it is robust to BOA errors up to this point, and if it gets outside this region, it'll be uh, suppressed. So, and, okay, let's go back. Okay, based on the, based on the robust GAC structure that is proposed by uh, Hoshiyama and co-workers, uh, Helbert and Kellerman, they suggested a frequency domain implementation of a similar uh, robust GSC. So there are some advantages. The first one is, in the first one, um, the Hoshiyama scheme, they use a time domain implementation of all the constraints and uh, um, adaptive filters and things like that. But then if we go to the frequency domain, we can additionally use other filtering techniques which uh, mainly uh, uh, apply to the signal spectrum instead of the time domain signal. So we can do something like equalization, for example. 
And then uh, it's computationally less, exp less expensive, especially when we do blockwise something like MCLT. But then it still has the same problem. If there is a large amount of isotropic ambient noise, it cannot cancel it because it's also coming from the same direction as the target signal. So it's, uh, it's not very good in canceling the ambient noise. Another thing is the constraints on the coefficient constraint adaptive filter is still implemented in the time domain. So what they do is just to compute the constraints, they go back to the time domain using IFFT and then compute the constraints and go back to the frequency domain using FFT. They do it like several times. So I think that it's conceptually not very elegant. But then, um, okay. Now we have another scheme, which is which we call the instantaneous direction of arrival, IDOA, based spatial filtering, which was proposed by Alex and Ivan. And it's going to be um, presented at uh, I1 this year. And uh, this is based on nonlinear post processing of the beamformer output, and it can significantly improve the di directivity patterns of the whole system. So, what it does do is it first finds the uh, in instantaneous direction of arrival for each beam based on the phase difference between uh, the input signals. And then this can be used to perform spatial filtering because uh, it gives us a measure how confident we can be that the uh, signal in this beam comes from this direction or that direction. So we can do uh, some filtering um, based on this instantaneous direction of arrival. And it has been shown that this can actually improve the directivity pattern in many cases, as we can see here. So this is, I guess, for uh, uh, 1,000 hertz. Okay, this is the original beamformer. We get like 10 dB, uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 dB suppression of no, uh, interference that comes from this direction. But still, you can see that this, it's too wide, right? But then if we use post-filtering, post-processing using the spatial filter, you know, based on the instantaneous DOA, then we get a shape something like this. So there's a huge advantage in this region. If we take a look at the directivity index and compare the beam only the beamformer and beamformer uh, post-processed using the spatial filter, we can see that there is uh, a considerable gain that we can obtain from spatial filtering based on IDOA. But it also has some uh, problems, which is if we make the beam too narrow in the post-processor, then we can hear there are some distortions which are non-negligible. And at the same time, we also hear musical noise from these distortions. So that's, that's a problem. And moreover, when there is a large ambient noise, it still suffers from the same problem because it cannot cancel noise that comes from the same direction. So it's not very useful uh, by itself if we apply it to our application, which is canceling ambient noise and also directional interference that, that we hear inside the car. So how does the proposed algorithm look like? So the motivation is this. Uh, all is not gold that glitters. And then, to put it in technical terms, what we mean by here, uh, by all is not gold that glitters is, all is not the target signal that, uh, that we want to preserve that comes from the beamformer. So sometimes the beamformer output can contain only noise. Sometimes there will be a very small amount of target signal plus lots of noise. So this is the original structure of the robust GSC. Let's consider this case. What if this, the beamformer output contains only noise? Then what should we do? Then we shouldn't try to cancel it from each input channel because this has only noise, right? The best thing to do is don't, don't remove anything from the uh, don't remove this beamformer output from each channel and just pass each channel to the adaptive interference canceller. Why? Because they contain no signal and just noise. So what do we do? What should we do if this beamformer output contains the target signal? Then we should prevent this from being canceled at this interference canceller. So we first subtract this target signal part from each channel and pass only the interference to the adaptive interference canceller. 
And this adaptive interference canceler should cancel the interference, remaining interference in the beamformer output. So this is the uh, major trick that makes our proposed method work. If it is signal, then don't cancel, uh, then subtract it from each input channel to get only interference. If it's only interference, do not do, it, do not cancel it from the input um, from the input signals such that we can have more interference at this point. So how to do that? Based on this observation, we propose the following structure. So if we compare this and this, these are the new things. So this is a probability that will be multiplied to the output of the beamformer. And then the signal that is the multiproduct of this probability and the beamformer output will be canceled from, will be removed from each input channel, input signals. So how does it look like? This P of K, so, so let me show you the, uh, the update equations. So we first compute Y sub sig signal, which is the probability that the kth bin will contain a target signal that comes from a given direction, and then scale the beamformer output to obtain only the signal part. Okay, and then what? How is the error computed? The error is computed by subtracting uh, the transformed uh, signal uh, from the input uh, input channel. So. This contains only the error or interference. And now we use the, uh, the usual um, update equation where this one is divided by the power, uh, by, by the energy since we are using a normalized LMS scheme. So how does it differ from the original one? Here we assume that YBF contains only the target signal. So we always try to uh, subtract the portion that is correlated to the target signal from each input channel. But now, what do we do? We multiply it by a confidence measure, whether this is a signal or noise. So this part is different, so this part. And now the error is computed by, uh, as the difference between these two. But here we, uh, we compute the error by subtracting not the product of the adaptive, beam for, uh, adaptive uh, blocking matrix and the original beamform output but then the one that is multiplied by the confidence level, which shows whether it is signal or noise. So this P1K for the first channel is the probability that the kth frequency bin contains speech signal that comes from the desired direction. So if it, uh, if it is not a speech signal, then it will be zero. If it's a speech signal that comes from a different direction based on IDOA, then we make it zero. If it's a speech signal that comes from the desired direction, we make it 1. So it, it takes a value between 0 and 1. And if P1 is, P1K is close to 0, it means that this contains mostly noise. If P1K is close to 1, it means that uh, the beamformer output contains mostly target signal. So ideally, this probability should uh, should be the probability that the kth frequency beam contains a speech signal from a desired direction. But then for now, we are implementing it using, by cascading a voice activity detector and the IDOA based probability estimator. So this P of K is a product of um, the probability that the current frame has speech. And then it is multiplied by the product uh, uh, probability that the signal comes from the given direction, where we have two parameters. The first one is the direction of arrival that we expect. And this is the, uh, uh, the deviation that is allowed for, for the target signal. So if we are sure that it comes from only 20 degrees, but we want to allow DOA errors up to plus minus 5 degrees, then this should be 5. So in this current implementation of the algorithm, uh, we cascade the VAD and the IDOA-based probability estimator to obtain this probability. And this is multiplied to the beamformer output, such that we get only the signal, target signal proportion from the, uh, from the beamformer output. That's the whole idea. So 
this is a quick, uh, quick example what does the I, what the IDOA based probability estimator does. This is the DOA that we that we expect the target signal will come from, and we allow uh, minus minus plus minus theta deviation. Okay, then it computes the probability. For example, if we don't allow DOA errors, we will only compute this probability, uh, which means that this value means which gives us the probability that the target signal is coming from theta direction of arrival. But then in this case, if we allow deviation from the actual, actual expect, oh no, not actual, the, the expected direction of arrival, we, comp we compute these probabilities and then choose the maximum. So if the target signal comes be is located between this, this angle and this angle, it will always get the um, or get a maximum probability. <coughs> so you won't be canceled from the adaptive in interference canceler. So the proposed method has the following advantages. First of all, uh, similar to the robust GSC, uh, we, the, it is robust to the steering vector errors without using ad hoc schemes like scaling down or scaling up the coefficients. Another thing is, unlike the co uh, we saw that when we using this coefficient constrained adaptive filtering, it is not guaranteed that the blocking matrix will have a null only between those regions, because you know, uh, uh, yeah, theoretically it's not guaranteed. But in this case, we are directly dealing with the direction of arrival, so it's more elegant and it's guaranteed that uh, signal that is outside the re outside the expected region will be cancelled. Inside the region will not be cancelled. And interference and noise are passed to the uh, adaptive interference canceller without being suppressed at the adaptive blocking matrix because we pass as much as possible, which, is, which we can view as interference or noise, to the adaptive interference canceller. So the adaptive interference canceller has more information that can be canceled from the output of the beamformer. So, okay, it was a long explanation. Now it's time to show you some experimental results. So this is the setup where we took the in-car recordings. So the co-driver is, uh, the distance between the microphone array and the co-driver is around 70 centimeters. And then the, the angle is around 22 degrees. And then they read a few passages on the various conditions, like um, we had two male, speaker, uh, male speakers and two female speakers. We were driving on the local local roads and also on the freeway. The AC was turned on and off. And then we initially closed the window and then also did experiments for when the window is two inches open um, and also half open. So I have to thank my fellow interns, Chris, Louis, and Sibel and Lund. They were very helpful. And we used several in-car recordings to evaluate the performance of different schemes. So we compared four schemes. The first one is only the beamformer, the simple delay and sum beamformer, and then delay and sum beamformer plus spatial filter based on IDOA, and then the robust GSC unconstrained, and then the IDOA based GSC, which is the proposed model. So the processed wave files, uh, we can hear it, listen to it. Okay, let me change to the mouse mode. Okay, this is the original signal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. As we can, so we took this recording while uh, local driving and the windows were closed, the AC was on. So it's quite noisy, as you can, oh, as you can hear. Okay, now let's listen to the beamformer output and spatial filtering. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
That's quite good, except the music noise. You can hear really, really loud, something like this. Oh, this one doesn't use the adaptive filter, so it's kind of stationary. But then the ambient noise level is very high. But is, is the ambient noise changing over time? Uh, no, not in, not in this example. Noise suppressor after this? No. We are just using a beamformer and a spatial filter. Maybe it's an. Mm -hmm. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Now the proposal. So initially, you can see that until it, the, the adaptive One, filter two, adapts, three, the noise four, decreases five, like this. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in time domain, this is the original signal. And this is the denoise signal using the proposed IDOA-based robust GSC. OK, we also have other examples, but you can listen to it if you're interested in it after the talk. So this is the spectrogram of the input signal. So here is the speech, and then this, uh, this part is noise. And we can see that it's pretty noisy. And this is the spectrogram of the IDOA-based GSE output. Uh, we can, if we compare this and this, we can see that it has become much cleaner. Oop. With less noise. It needs some time to adapt. So from this point, the low noise level is very, small, very low. Uh, if we uh, take a look at the spectrum, this is the deno uh, spectrum of the denoised, ideal, um, uh, denoised output. As we can see, because this is a speech frame, uh, we have harmonics here. Sometimes uh, in the low frequency bands, it's affected a little bit. In the high frequency bands, they are about the same compared to the original one. But then if we take a look at the noise spectrum in noise frames, then we can see that it it has, been, uh, has become much smaller from 20, 20 dB to 10 dB in higher frequency bands, like this. So the following is the result for a female speech. Uh, when we compare the proposed method, uh, the SNR of the proposed method with the SNR of the original input, we can see that initially uh, the SNR was 12, uh, 12 dB. After processing it with the proposed one, it was 21. For local driving, AC on, so which is the previous example that you just listened to. And for another example, which is local driving, AC off, the initial uh, SNR was much higher, 15, 15.7. And now we have 24, so we have about 8.3 dB gain. And then on free A driving, AC on, the, the SNR is quite low, which is 4. And now we have 13, so we have 8.8 .8 SNR improvement. And now this is a freeway driving AC off, 3.9 to 12. That, but then I have to mention that the um, SNR improvement is uh, measured between um, in the frequency bands between 300 hertz to uh, 3400 hertz because we are mainly interested in the region where we have speech. And I think it's a, it's a reasonable measure. This is the result. The RGSC is the one we, we heard earlier. Uh, you're saying? Uh, no, actually, only we listen to the original input, the informal plus spatial filter, and then the proposed method. This still has lots of ambient noise. You can, we, we can hear it after the talk if you are interested. For male speech, 
it's about the same. In this case, even though the uh, AC was turned off, there was more uh, harsher um, low frequency, low frequency noise, so which has canceled a lot from the maze pitch, which has lots of low frequency components. So we had low, uh, low SNR improvement, only 5.7. So compared to others, it was kind of low. But then for others, it's about the same as in female speech. Yeah, question? Uh, I shouldn't have said female or male. I can't even remember. Female. 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 So, to me, that one, uh, <laughs> this, the 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 second, the beamform is spatial. It actually had almost less artifacts. Um, I mean, and also it looked, looked really clean. But according to your plot, the um, SNR improvement is hardly at all, and yours is very significant. So, mm -hmm. was the one that you showed like an outlier that worked really well, or was it was it? I don't know. It's like the average example. Oh, so that one. this one? This one? No. This one. This one. Oh, this one. So that one versus the one before it. Uh huh. Uh, oh no, you don't have the spectrogram of the EFS. Yeah, we we we, we don't have it. Further, I think you have one. Yeah. Uh, no, for no, so I, I don't have the spectrogram uh, for so that so one. one. So I, I showed you the audition. Maybe just to make one clarification here, so the signal to noise ratio measurements in the table are for the band between 300 and 3400. And it looks, and it looks that it suppresses 9 dB, but actual suppression, if you measure from 0 to 7000, is quite larger because, look here, this is a substantial amount of energy which on the next slide we get rid of. So one more mm -hmm. and one more. So practically the improvement are between here and here for the telephone channel. So this amount of energy is not accounted for. Therefore it looks more impressive in Adobe addition the numbers on the table. No, I actually think it's the other way. I think actually the number on the table looks much better than I would expect. I don't have the Adobe. Oh yeah, I can play that. So this is the spot. on you the time detector. The time domain we can see that this part is actually much larger. But then from the spectrogram it's not easy to be easy to see. Let me show you the spectrogram. For beam former and spatial filtering. So the noise in this part is actually much larger for the. Um, Can we see the other one again? Yeah, sure. That's also mainly under 300 hertz. The noise. Yeah, we so so. That's right. But then we are measuring the you know the SNR only from this point. Uh -huh. on filtered waveforms, then it would be easier to compare. Oh, yeah. Because then we, we could correlate what we see. Uh -huh. Because we yeah, see that's more true. than what you use to measure, then it's, it's okay. hard, mm -hmm. right? So, but if, if these waveforms had been filtered to uh -huh. 300 to 300, yeah, I mean, then we could correlate. Yeah, if the target is for telephones, why not just use the ITU telephone frequency spectrum only for these? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So this is a little misleading, because you just say, so see the noise, but you, you point right. to something that is not mm -hmm. being accounted okay, okay. for. Yeah, I agree. Yes, that's right. By the way, it, when you measure SNR, I imagine you're just measuring the energy of the residual no noise and then the energy of the yes. uh, signal it's, part it's, it's, and then the ratio, right? So the distortions in the signal are not accounted on the SNR metric. Oh, right? uh, yeah, that's right. Because I think one small disadvantage of the growth method is that it did lead to a few more noticeable distortions that's true. in the signal, mm -hmm. right? So it just gives you a look. yeah. Has there been a subjective quality uh, testing of the results of this in terms of what people think of the results? Because I thought that uh -huh. the proposed algorithm has a very nasally sound to the end result. Uh -huh. um, and we, we didn't do almost test. It was just me and my mentor. So, well. 
<laughs> Did you do any experiments with uh, cancellation of uh, jammers? The kid screaming in the back of the car? Or? Oh, no, we didn't do that. But we, we have another experiment, uh, which has a speaker that speaks from uh, where the DOA is 22 degrees, and another, another one at minus 30 degrees. And um, from minus 30 degrees, uh, only the, the main speaker is speaking. And from 22 degrees, the female speaker is speaking. And in the output, we could barely, we could barely hear the uh, male speaker and only the female speaker. What did the desired speech when the other person was speaking and there was overlap? Oh, there, there's overlap. So we can still hear a little bit of the male speaker, even though we suppressed it. But then the major portion, uh, we, but then the female speech was much larger than the male speech in that experiment. Did it distort the near the desired speech? Uh, not really, not too much. Uh, one, one important source of signal distortion is the use of probability, which high, uh, um, strongly depends on the VAD. So it's not a very good VAD because we just wanted to uh, uh, check the concept, whether it will work or not. So even though it should give a, a smooth transition between speech frames and noise frames, then it, it, it doesn't work very well. So with some part of the musical noise comes from the poor performance of the VAD. Another thing is uh, the adaptive interference canceller is made much slower than the adaptive blocking matrix. But then that part is giving rise to some echo-like effects. So that part has to be changed as well. And maybe fine-tune the parameters, but we didn't have too much time to find the best parameter. Uh, no, we are making independent decisions for uh, for each frequency bin. That could be part of the cause, right? Yeah, you that's might it. have a, a more robust uh, estimate mm -hmm. if you combine bins and make joint decisions under the assumption that things shouldn't change too much mm -hmm. across neighboring bins. That's example. right. right. So, in this implementation, as I already explained, um, you know, as I already explained, we are cascading the VAD and the uh, IDOA-based probability estimator. It's just, we are just cascading it to obtain that probability. But then somehow they should work together. Yeah, that's right. And then I'm sure that the, the overall uh, pers uh, the, the quality when, when we listen to the output will become much, much better. Less musical noise and maybe less echo-like effect. So time to conclude. As we can see that uh, the ideal-based robust GSC, it has, uh, can, uh, it has higher interference and ambient noise rejection. And at the same time, it's robust to a steering vector error, even though we didn't show experimental results for this. And however, there, there are some problems that I've already mentioned. The first one is this echo-like effects after the speech frames, and also the musical noise between speech. And this comes from the fact that we are measuring the, the probability of speech presence from the expected direction of arrival just by cascading the VAD and the IDOA-based estimator. So if we change focus on that part and improve it, then I'm sure that this will somehow be uh, reduced. I don't know by, by how much, but then I believe that it will become much better. So future work, uh, some, some suggestions. First of all, we modified the adaptive blocking matrix, but not the adaptive interference canceller. But then, as you can see, if uh, the VAD uh, doesn't uh, make transitions very smoothly, so it kind of switches on and off. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get the musical noise. So if AI is, and that will change the characteristic of the input interference signal, which is fed into the adaptive interference canceller. So maybe the adaptive interference canceller should also make, make use of the knowledge what is used to turn on and off or change the uh, behavior of the blocking matrix. Another thing is making the VAD more robust 
and also the estimation of the speech presence probability from the expected direction of arrival per frequency being more, uh, more effective than the current implementation, which is just a simple cascade of those two things. So these are several references um, if you are interested. And this concludes my talk. Thank you very much.